I am thrilled uh, to be here just because what you all are doing in practice, focusing on details, is a spiritual truth of our country. You know, we can be Democrats and Republicans, but most Americans are patriots. For over a decade now, good ideas have emanated from the BPC. Thank you for convening this very impressive group of, of thought leaders. Your organization has brought together leaders from across our society to advocate for common sense solutions to our most challenging problems. Because if it's bipartisan, it's much more likely to pass. When you have people philosophically and ideologically in two different worlds, and they put them together on a committee, that committee usually is not very productive. Once we get staffs blending, and John and I, they know that the members are friends and we talk, things can happen. Thank you, Anand, for that introduction, and to the BPC for its important efforts. Thank the bipartisan policy uh, center. You, you guys are great. I have, uh, we all have bipartisan responsibilities to this nation to defend principles that have long made America the beacon of hope. It's going to take all of us to try to turn down the temperature and really focus on what unites us. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today to uh, talk about an important topic, a timely top topic in healthcare delivery, something I'm very excited to listen to the discussions that's going to follow here. I'm Bill Hoagland. I have the privilege of working with our healthcare team here at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Uh, let me state what should be obvious to all by now, that COVID, the COVID pandemic, despite its uh, terrible consequences for so many families and individuals, it did create the perfect test lab for telehealth. The pandemic has proved, I think, that using rapid tests and more reliance on telehealth, that the public is primed to handle more medical needs with greater independence. When the pandemic first took hold, significant changes were made by the at the federal level uh, to telehealth policy to ensure people could continue to have access uh, to virtual care. And one of the most uh, significant changes Medicare made was to allow all beneficiaries, regardless of medical condition or geographic location, to access um, medical uh, uh, medical appointments from their home. And Medicare also started paying providers the same for telehealth visits as in-person visits and deemed phone calls an acceptable form of telehealth. As a result, uh, telehealth use exploded. And in 2020, it was a 44% of Medicare beneficiaries had at least one telehealth visit. Uh, by 2021, Medicare beneficiary telehealth use leveled off, but it still has remained almost 40 times higher than pre-pandemic levels. However, most of these changes, I think you know, are temporary and tied to uh, the declaration of a public health emergency, which, by the way, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, uh, Mr. Becerra, last uh, Thursday, I believe, it did extend the public health emergency through January of next year. Thus, this raises some questions whether policymakers should make some of the changes permanent, what types of services should remain accessible via telehealth moving forward, under what circumstances, and particularly how should reimbursements work. In April 2021, almost a year and a half ago, we began an extensive effort to develop evidence-based federal policy recommendations for the effective use of telehealth beyond the public health emergency. Our report, The Future of, of Telehealth After COVID-19, uh, uh, was, was accompanied by a series of, of, of data analysis on Medicare fee-for-service telehealth claims, and which uh, we released this report last week. That The analysis that we performed and the recommendations focused on four categories, foundational, that is the issues that cut across all uh, service areas. It also focused on behavioral health, primary care, and specialty services. I think one surprising result of our meta-analysis of Medicare claims data, though telehealth was initially intended to extend access to care to rural residents, our analysis found that people in urban areas use telehealth as much higher rates than their rural counterparts. The further from urban centers people lived, the less likely they were to use telehealth service, which again suggests the usual problems associated with having access to high-speed internet in those particular rural communities. 
This is just one finding that are that informs the recommendations that we put forth to at least extend the flexibilities to deliver telehealth at least for two years uh, once the public health emergency ends while formally evaluating its import. Finally, I would be totally remiss if I did not give a shout out to the BPC staff that devoted so much time over the last year and a half to this project. Senior policy analyst, Julia Harris, Sabat Badhana, uh, project manager, Brady Newell, Marilyn Serapini, the executive director of our public health or BPC health program, and particularly our consultant, Aparna Higgins, a senior policy fellow at Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy. I think people's interest in telehealth and overall digital health will endure far beyond the pandemic. We are excited to continue our work with our funder, the Peterson Center for Healthcare. And at this time, I'd like to introduce Jeff Selberg, Senior Advisor at the uh, Peterson Center, uh, to say a few words. Jeff, welcome. Thanks, Bill. It's uh, just great to be with you here today. On behalf of Michael Peterson and the Peterson Center on Healthcare, I want to thank you and the PPC healthcare team for your work on evaluating the impact of telehealth during the pandemic. I think it's important to say that the Peterson Foundation has had a long-standing relationship with the Bipartisan Policy Center, not only for the quality of their research, uh, but also for their pragmatic approach to identifying solutions to tough policy issues. The Peterson Center on Healthcare's mission is to reduce cost and improve the value of healthcare on a national scale. This would be relatively easy, believe it or not, if we were not equally committed to protecting quality and improving equity at the same time. The challenge has gotten more intense, wage revenue and supply chain pressures combined with other inflationary pressures are pushing the boundaries of affordability, not only for individuals, but also for employers, state and federal government. As a result, we're not able to make equally important public investments without significantly adding to our public debt. We believe that the solutions will be found in identifying, validating, and scaling innovative approaches to how healthcare is provided, as well as addressing the incentives created by how it is paid for. Being clear how policy can support this endeavor is essential. While COVID-19 was a dis major disruptive force in our healthcare system, it created out of necessity the opportunity to expand and test telehealth as an alternative to in-office visits. I myself tested it several times and found it great. But what was the impact of expanding that level of access and should it continue post-pandemic? Well, why even ask the question? Unfortunately, in many cases, our experience with applying technology in healthcare, especially in a fee-for-service environment, is that technology can be additive as opposed to replacing current approaches, which means expenditures go up rather than going down. So what of telehealth? Should the policies instituted at the height of the pandemic be extended post-pandemic and how might that lay a foundation for further, more extensive applications in digital health? As part of their analysis, BPC was able to assess legislative and regulatory factors that changed during COVID-19. This informed pragmatic policy recommendations on the appropriate use of telehealth going forward in a way that is evidence-based and will promote better outcomes for Medicare beneficiaries and the value for the Medicare program. I look forward to hearing from today's panel on how Medicare can thoughtfully continue to incorporate telehealth into the delivery of healthcare with an eye towards quality, equity, and especially affordability. Bill, thanks again, and I'll pass it back to you. Thank you very much, Jeff. And once again, thank you and thanks the Peterson Center for Healthcare for your support of this uh, work that we do here. At this time, I'd like to introduce our moderator for today, 
She's a nationally recognized leader in telehealth policy, Mei Kuang. She is the executive director of the Center for Connected Health Policy, which plays a, a few different roles within the telehealth policy landscape. We are extremely pleased to have her join us today to moderate this discussion. So I turn it over to you now, May. Take it away. Thank you, Bill. And thank you to the Bipartisan Policy Center for inviting me today to participate in the event. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss an issue that has long been a focus of the CCHP's work. For those who are not familiar, CCHP is the federally designated National Telehealth Policy Resource Center. We provide resources and educational materials on telehealth policy. So this report is a welcome addition to the information that is out there. The report that we're discussing today sheds new light on telehealth's monumental impact on the delivery of health care during the pandemic, and by extension, its impact on patients. BPC went through a rigorous process to develop evidence-based recommendations for the Medicare program, while acknowledging there is still more study needed of telehealth's downstream impacts on costs, quality, and health outcomes. I look forward to discussing BPC's recommendations to extend telehealth flexibilities beyond the public health emergencies with our panelists today, and you have a great lineup of panelists. Before I introduce them, a reminder to our audience that if you wish to submit questions for today's talk, to please do it through YouTube or Twitter with the hashtag BPCLive. Now, let me introduce you to our stellar lineup of panelists today. Lori, uh, Dr. Lori Usher Pines is a senior policy researcher at Rand Corporation. Her current research projects include assessing the impact of telehealth on quality and access to care. She is conducting an evaluation on the implementation of telehealth programs in safety net settings, as well as evaluating the effectiveness of virtual breastfeeding support via mobile app. Dr. Elaine Ku is an assistant professor at the UCSF School of Medicine and a general internist and clinical informatician at San Francisco General Hospital. And Dr. Rebecca Brendel is president of the American Psychiatric Association and associate professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, where she also serves as director of Master of Bioethics Program and associate director for the Center for Bioethics. Dr. Brindell practices clinical and forensic psychiatry at Massachusetts General Hospital, where she is director of law and ethics at the Center for Law, Brain, and Behavior. She is also admitted to the Massachusetts Bar. Now, I'll give our panelists an opportunity to do one or two minutes of opening statements. So we'll start with Dr. Usher Pines. Hello, welcome, welcome everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Lori Usher Pines, and my work over the past 10 years or so has focused on the impact of telemedicine on access, quality, as well as costs. I do quite a bit of work on um, telemedicine for the underserved, including in safety net settings. And one thing that um, I think is really important that I hope that we discuss uh, a great deal today is telehealth and its impact on health equity. Um, and what's interesting here is that telehealth can really advance or threaten health equity depending on how it's designed and the policy environment surrounding it. Um, in the pre-COVID world, the policy framework really limited access to telehealth um, overall, but those who did get access were some of the most underserved. For example, as Bill pointed out, there was a real focus on rural populations. Um, and as the BPC report found, you know, as well as others, rural populations now seem to be utilizing telehealth at lower rates than other populations. Um, so something we need to be cognizant of is really, as we roll out telemedicine programs, are we reaching the populations we hope to reach? Are we um, uh, delivering telehealth in a way that's equitable? And, and what could be driving some of these rural urban disparities you know, could be things like the digital divide, mistrust, or preferences uh, about uh, how to seek care. You know, it's unclear really what's driving it, but it's important in the future for, to research, for research to really address that. Um, and one other point, um, one thing that we worry about at this point in the pandemic is, what, is whether more affluent patients are getting video visits and lower income or older patients are getting audio only visits. So audio only visits is something I study um, pretty in depth. And you know, we're worried also about, the, about health equity um, and how that plays out with different modalities. And it's gonna be really important going forward that we are able to differentiate between audio only and video visits in claims data and other data sources so we can understand how how telehealth expansion is impacting equity and access to different modalities of care. Thank you, Dr. Usher Pines, Dr. Kuhn. 
Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Elaine Kong. I'm a assistant professor at UCSF. I also do research in, in digital health and thinking about how we can use digital health tools to improve chronic disease care in, in safety in a setting, similar to um, Dr. Usher Pine. Um, very excited to be here and discuss the topic of telehealth with the rest of the panel. I think some of the excitement around telehealth really highlights um, some of the reasons that I've been particularly excited about digital health tools, which is that it allows us to think about how do we deliver clinical care outside of sort of these discrete clinical visits. So not only outside the brick and mortar setting of a clinic, but also as a frontline clinician, a lot of that care that actually starts to happen between, between clinic visits, so other forms of telehealth aside from telemedicine. I think one of the things and the excitement around telehealth um, that really highlights for me is that I think the healthcare system has historically been very clinician, clinician centered, right? We ask patients to come to us for these discrete clinical visits and telehealth and the excitement around it from the patient side and clinician side has really shown that there's a desire to improve access and desire to make care more patient centered and to think about how we can deliver care outside of these every three month, three month visits. Um, one thing that was really clear during during COVID, which um, I hope we will touch upon, is that you know this large introduction of telehealth and the expansion of telehealth was introduced in a really weird context, right? Uh, a lot of clinicians were viewing this as a replacement for in-person care. And uh, I still have patients who are actually scared about coming into the, into the visits. And so they want to do telehealth visit, not because they actually would prefer that over an in-person visit, but, but they're actually still, still scared to come in. And so you know, a lot of this data coming out initially really comes from the early signs of the pandemic. And it's really hard to know if what we see clinically, if that's a result of COVID versus telehealth itself. And so um, it's going to take some time before us, we can really understand the impact of telehealth. Um, the last thing I'm just going to close off with um, to highlight some of the things that Dr. Usher Pines discussed is, is two things. One is that uh, when we think about telehealth as a, as a frontline clinician, I, I like to think about it instead of, you know, as a replacement for in-person care, which is what a lot of people thought about during COVID, is really thinking about figuring out when we should best deliver telehealth for each specific patient um, when it's best suited for them. So you, for each patient is different, each clinical situation is different and just treating audio only visits or video visits all as the same thing for every single clinical scenario doesn't really make a ton of sense. And we really need to get into the nitty gritties as a clinician to understand when it's best for a patient. And then the second thing is as a safety net provider, I was in that safety net setting where we were really primarily doing 95%, 99% audio only visits. Uh, there are clear issues of, of equity and access and I think it's really important as this new innovation comes into healthcare that we are very mindful about how to make sure we address any structural barriers to, to equity. And that is not only at a patient level, but um, also at a healthcare system level. Certain clinics have a much harder time delivering video visits, for example. And so really thinking about equity in a multi-level way is going to be really important to ensure that this innovation is equitable for all populations. Look forward to chatting with the rest of the panelists. Thank you, Dr. Kong. Um, Dr. Brendel? Thank you for inviting me to be here today on behalf of the American Psychiatric Association. And I'm really looking forward to uh, talking with the other panelists about the implications of telehealth. You know, in psychiatry um, and in terms of mental health, prior to the public health emergency, 64% of psychiatrists had never uh, engaged in any kind of telehealth practice. And what we know is that as of January of 2021, 81% 80 of psychiatrists had uh, engaged in uh, telemental health. Um, we know, as my colleagues have already said, that access to high quality evidence-based care uh, that's affordable for every American is a critical policy priority. And it's no more important than in mental health right now when we know that we're in a mental health crisis as the pandemic moves to an endemic phase. So what we're really looking at now is um, this opportunity where we've been able to reach patients in particular uh, for mental health care that's often elusive and hard to access in ways that in our own polling, as recently as this summer, 90% of respondents found that uh, their first telehealth visit was e either somewhat, they were either somewhat or highly satisfied. And we know that the entry into ongoing and effective mental health treatment 
comes from a successful first experience among other factors. So at a time when we're facing uh, problems like my colleagues mentioned in terms of equity, in terms of access, um, in terms of varying levels of uh, digital divide, both with digital fluency um, and the availability of broadband internet to support video telehealth um, and telemental health, uh, we have a lot of work ahead of us, but we also have really exciting opportunities to be able to use data-driven metrics uh, to make high-quality evidence-based mental health care accessible and affordable to all Americans. Thank you, Dr. Brendel, and thank you everyone for those opening comments here. I'm going to transition us into our panel discussion, but a reminder to our audience, if you have questions for our panelists, please submit them through YouTube or Twitter with the hashtag BPC Live, L-I-V-E. Um, I'm going to start us off with like our first question, which is really the big question that is on a lot of people's minds is about the flexibility. So for the pandemic and the Medicare program, telehealth services were only authorized for a subset of beneficiaries, primarily those living in rural areas that had a very specific definition by the Medicare program and a limited set of services. During the pandemic, the types of services allowed via telehealth and eligible providers greatly expanded, and that resulted in more use of telehealth and explosion of telehealth delivered services. In addition to Congress allowing individuals to access telehealth services from their home, something that many believed was a key factor in sustaining services. So we know there's been a lot of discussion on what telehealth flexibilities to keep, how long to keep them, um, and also what happened what will happen once the public health emergency ends. Congress legislated that the telehealth provision, provision should stay in place for an additional five months after the PHE, 151 days. In the BPC report, they found that many stakeholders want telehealth and audio only flexibilities to continue, but policymakers have suggested that more study needed to take place prior to making those changes permanent. So what are, you, what are your thoughts on that initially? And we can start with, um, you know, perhaps Dr. Kuhn, who has a primary care provider. Um, what are your thoughts on keeping around some of these flexibilities, knowing that at least we have a grace period after the PHG, but afterwards at this point, we know that that will end completely once that grace period is over. I personally fully support that recommendation. I think um, to some of the points I was making earlier, is that for us to really know the impact of telehealth on clinical outcomes, it's going to it's going to take some time, especially since we're still, you know, um, you know, COVID has faded a little bit into the background, but that's still very much impacting what we're what we're seeing. And on top of it, um, you know, there's a lot of concerns about audio only visits. And I think there is interest and, and efforts and policy efforts to address some of those structural barriers, right? Some of the infrastructure development that needs to happen, for example, in rural areas to be able to get everybody access to video visits. And I think unless until we get those structural barriers addressed, we really need to keep as much um, flexibility in place as possible to ensure um, equitable access. And so I, I agree with sort of extending it and making sure there is a concerted effort to um, one, sort of study the impact of different types of telehealth, and then uh, two, uh, certain sources of data, it's really hard to distinguish if something is an audio-only visit, visit, if it's a video visit, um, what the purpose of the visit is. And, and these are the, at least as a clinician, these are really the nitty-gritty details that help me determine, is this patient appropriate for this, this type of visit? And until we get better data that helps us understand that, I think we need to keep access available. Mm -hmm. Dr. Pa um, Usher Pines? Sure. So um, just to pick up on this uh, topic on audio only visits, um, we've been tracking federally qualified health centers in California throughout the pandemic. Um, and what we learned is that audio only visits really were essential for federally qualified health centers in maintaining access to care. Um, in, in the beginning of the pandemic, um, audio only visits were the dominant modality, uh, and we had about 49% of visits being delivered via uh, audio only versus 3% via video. So audio only, you know, very dominant, and um, the early pandemic really showed the challenges in transitioning over to video visits. And these challenges included both patient level barriers as well as clinic level barriers. So, you know, both at play here. What has surprised us actually is not this initial reliance on audio only visits, but that 
the FQHCs still really need the audio only visits. They have struggled to implement video visits even with two and a half years of implementation time. Um, we just received data from our clinics uh, covering through this past summer. Um, and still one in four visits are audio only visits and audio only visits um, outnumber video visits three to one. So there still is this, you know, continued, um, continued need for them. Um, but, you know, we are worried about the equity implications, as, as I mentioned, um, is it, are we creating a two tiered system, right, where lower income patients do get audio only visits only. And that's something that, that we need to, to, to keep in mind going forward. Um, and it's going to be really tricky again because we can't differentiate very well in claims data between different types of telehealth modalities. And when you're studying the impact of telehealth on access, quality, and costs, not knowing what you're looking at is a problem, right? Are you looking at video visits? Are you looking at audio-only visits? Are you looking at some unclear combination of the two? Um, and, and, and without more data on that, we're, we're, we're going to be struggling to really make sense of the trends that we're seeing. Um, Dr. Pi Usher Pines, I want to pick up on something that you said there regarding the audio only visit, because we know that the extension, the five month extension that Congress has in place only extends some of the telehealth policy waivers that were done for the pandemic, not all of them, but they do extend the audio only one. They also extend allowing federally qualified health centers, which has been like the focus of your study. Um, and also, you know, a the providers for a lot of primary care services for a much a lot of the population of the country mm -hmm. as well too, allowing them to continue using audio only during that five month period. Now, Dr. Brandel, I, I want to turn to you because as Dr. Usher Pines brought up the audio only component, that also was a major, major way of delivering mental health services to patients during the pandemic was the use of like that audio only as well. So with only that five month time frame allowed, I mean, is that sufficient time to, as Dr. Usher Pines was talking about, like transition people from like that audio only to like live video or give them like that sufficient amount of time to study like the use of like audio only and whether it is comparable to like in-person services or live video? I mean, how, how do, what do you think about that? Like only having five months to do that as opposed to like the recommendation from the BBC study, which is like two years to provide more time, but also more to not only study, but transition time, particularly for the folks that you focus in on and help or the people who need those mental health services. Well, let me begin by saying that at APA, we support making audio only uh, tele telemental health available and permanent. Uh, that being said, we also share in the concerns that Dr. Usher Pines outlined uh, so well uh, just before me that um, we know that access is critically important. We also, over time, have to understand and figure out how to not make sure, how to make sure that those who need mental health care um, are able to get it and that we don't have a divide and we do have equity in terms of the kind of mental health care that's available to every American. That being said, uh, there is a use, we believe, for audio uh, te only telehealth going forward, provided that it's patient centered and it is based on the clinical appropriateness, uh, the, cl the uh, clinical outcomes and the delivery of high quality care, not something that's based on the convenience of a particular mental health clinician or a particular clinic. So in really looking at uh, the models of care, uh, access to factors that make uh, health, uh, mental health care uh, more effective, such as availability of the record and medical record, electronic medical record interoperability, uh, audio only telehealth could provide a very important bridge for consistency of mental health care. Let me say just one more point on this, um, which is uh, that uh, in the um, audio only setting, right, that that may be a way of ensuring continuity of care uh, that might not otherwise be possible, especially with the findings that we see that the in rural communities that so are uh, so much in need of high quality mental health services, uh, access really didn't have an uptick the way uh, it did in uh, urban settings in the BPC report. And so that also uh, makes us realize that we have to come up with ways uh, that make continuity of care possible 
And for patients and uh, the, the clinics and the individual clinicians who serve them, uh, having some certainty around extending audio-only care would allow us to continue in our practice as we improve uh, the ways that we uh, deliver that care. Dr. Kuhl? Uh, th thank you. I want to just highlight um, something that Dr. Brendel said, which I think really aligns with my primary care experience, which is that uh, audio only can, it needs, if it's offered, it should be really patient centered. I'm focused on um, that being best for a patient. So I have been a really strong advocate for video visits um, in our clinic and um, just reflect on had a an, an elderly patient who really tried to get onto video visits. We had a social worker go out and try to teach the patient how to um, access our platform and multiple sessions of just teaching the patient how to open up a text message were, was not overwhelmingly successful. Um, and so, you know, if I was in a situation and this patient had transportation barriers to come to clinic, was oxygen dependent and didn't have a family member to really give this patient um, uh, rides. And so, you know, if we were in a system where really her only option was in-person versus video, and neither would work for this patient at all. And so for this patient, really getting better access was being able to have me, me call this patient. And so completely echo the concerns about making sure that lower income patients aren't getting, you know, audio only care. Um, but it, I think really should be available if that really is the only option for them. We just want to make sure that it's not providers sort of assuming that a patient can't access video visits or not trying um, not trying hard enough to really overcome some some of the barriers. And, and there are certainly large barriers. We have to do, our health system has to do a lot of lifting in terms of addressing digital skills issues to try to get patients on, on video. I have a couple of follow-up questions to comment you all made, but I'll start with the first one there, which um, Dr. Kuhn, something that you brought up. Now, if these waivers were to go away, let's just say tomorrow they just expired, we're through our 151 day grace period, et cetera, who do you think, what patient population do you think will actually be impacted the most? by these going away and really we're still in the same sort of policy situation we are today with what we know. I mean, I think the patients that are impacted the most, you know, and it's not um, data driven. So certainly if, if other panelists have some more data, would love to have them weigh in. But uh, my, my sense is the patients impacted the most are the ones who've always been historically excluded from, from healthcare, right? So, um, and so those are patients often um, populations of color, lower income individuals, folks with transportation issues. Uh, if that is, you know, a lot of the reason telehealth was available in rural areas was addressing geographic concerns of health transportation issues. I have some patients who have to take two public buses to come get me, to come see me, and that's like an hour and a half, an hour and a half journey. And so, the, you know, there's still transportation barriers there. And so I think those are the patients who would probably um, lose out the most when, when telehealth goes away. And I think as the PPC report attested to, it's oftentimes folks with more chronic diseases, those who need frequent appointments, uh, those who are dual eligible, so may have some disability, those who really just need more frequency of healthcare. Who, and since healthcare is often not as accessible as it should be, those are the ones who are going to be most impacted the most when tele, if telehealth policies return back to where they were before. Dr. Asher Pines or Dr. Brendel? Well, I don't, like Dr. Kuhn, I don't have any hard data to support this, but, uh, but our experience in providing clinical care um, in this country shows us that the people who are most likely to be affected are the ones who have, um, as Dr. Kuhn said, the greatest barriers to accessing care. And so uh, the harder it is to come in person, uh, the further away or uh, the less education or digital literacy that an individual has, the more it's going to affect them in being able to access mental health care. The other thing that's happened is that mental health care uh, often requires, um, uh, has historically often needed to be provided outside of work hours uh, because people need to come at a time uh, that they have regular appointments and they would otherwise uh, have to miss work or it would be inaccessible to them. And so the availability uh, both of audio only but telehealth more generally uh, can allow people to find a private space within the course of their day to follow up with appointments rather than having to make choices. Uh, between other places and they need to be in responsibilities they have and taking care of themselves, which we know is so needed right now. So 
I'm going to take ask you a question that takes the opposite viewpoint of sort of what Dr. Kuhn and Dr. Brandel has laid out in that there has also been some concerns during this pandemic that telehealth might exasperate um, disparities between population as well, just simply because of the access issue. And if you have a lot of policy that, you know, allows for telehealth to be used, but maybe not everybody's going to be able to access that. So, um, Dr. Um, Usher Pines, I don't know in some of that study that you've done with the safety net population, um, has there been any thoughts regarding that, regarding like, you know, the disparities that might take place if telehealth is pushed out a little bit further and being utilized more? Sure. So, you know, to pick up on an earlier point as well, um, telemedicine has the most promise in reaching uh, populations that are not connected to the healthcare system. You know, if we if we can do that, that would be a great win. Um, but, you know, some early data that we've seen from the pandemic suggests that the users of telehealth services are often the folks that are also utilizing in-person care. And telehealth is being delivered in the context of hybrid care models, so both telehealth and in-person. And I think we need to do more work to try to reach those patients who who really have not historically been served um, and reach them through telehealth. And then that provides a, a gateway to getting other healthcare services right beyond telehealth, because most of us agree that not, not everything can be accomplished via telehealth visits, right? You really um, need hybrid care to, to, to maximize quality and um, improve outcomes. So, you know, a, a little bit concerning that most of the users to date have been folks that are already um, receiving in-person services as well. Anybody else like to comment on that? If not, I'm going to move us on to um, another question here. So a lot of people may not be aware of it, but during the COVID public health emergency, we actually were underneath another public health emergency, and that's the opioid crisis. So for Dr. Brendel, telehealth played a critical role in assuring access to mental health services for pe people who are being treated for substance use disorder during the pan pandemic. There were a lot of articles, a lot of studies that they had reduced access to services. So telehealth was a bit of a lifeline for them. So since it's been a game changer for that profession, are, are you worried that maybe this is happening a little bit too fast, this shift over to like the virtual um, platform to provide these services? Or, you know, because as Dr. Usher Pines noted, like there, it can replace some in-person services, but it's not going to replace all of the services. So what are your thoughts on like how fast the uptake has been in provision of mental health services, such as those, be, those being treated for substance use disorder? Well, there's so many pieces to your question, and it's really um, there are really many sides of the of the issue, right? So the BPC analysis showed us that 44 percent of all mental health visits uh, during the the period of study were via telehealth, and of those, 65 um, percent were delivered outside of existing healthcare treatment relationships. That's really important because it's showing that people who hadn't previously come to mental health treatment, we're all of a sudden able to uh, access, it, access it. So that's the positive, right? It suggests that access is greater, although of course we need to look at access for who and make sure that access for those who have the greatest barriers and who we have historically as providers of medical care underserved. Um, that, you know, there's not that much to be worried about in terms of this rapid expansion, because we do have decades of data, for example, from the Veterans Administration and from other uh, treatment settings that show uh, that telehealth um, can be quite effective when it comes to develop, de uh, delivering mental health care. Uh, and we know that um, patients are coming back, which as I mentioned earlier, is one of the greatest barriers uh, continuing the treatment relationship. Um, and once people come back, they're more likely to uh, stay in treatment, to um, follow up with treatment plans, and uh, then more likely to have um, avoid other potential negative outcomes um, that are also costly, right? They're both personally, um, uh, personally burdensome in terms of emergency room visits, inpatient hospitalizations, but also not the most, uh, the, where they're preventable, not the most effective use of resources within the healthcare system. So, you know, there, uh, with opiates specifically, having the opportunity to get in to see a clinician as soon as possible, uh, especially given that uh, we've been in this opiate emergency now for five years, since 2017, and we know that we're not meeting the needs of all the patients who need treatment 
in particular for opiate use disorder. And so uh, while we see the promise of that and also accessibility of medication assisted treatment uh, for opiate use disorder, we're also aware that we need to uh, we need to be cautious, especially in the prescribing of medications to make sure that we are not having diversion of medications and to be sure that people are being safely treated. That's something that we can do. Uh, we do at APA support HHS's authority uh, to issue temporary waivers um, during a public health emergency like the opiate uh, crisis. And we do support ongoing availability of treatment um, and the prescribing of controlled substances provided that it is uh, patient-centered and not convenience-centered, that it's really providing safe and effective treatment uh, for patients who need it. Thank you, Dr. Brendel. We have a question from the audience from Jeff Selber. Does anyone on the panel believe that telehealth has the potential to reduce the cost of care, and if so, how? Anyone want to take on this? <laughs> Really large question. <laughs> I, I, I can start um, on this one. I think that telehealth telehealth advocates for many years were saying that telehealth improves access, you know, um, improves quality and decreases costs, right? And um, saying that it will do all three is maybe a little bit ambitious. You know, an economist will tell you that it's nearly impossible to do all three, and and I, and so I don't necessarily find that argument very compelling. I think that. Um, telehealth may increase utilization and costs, and that may be exactly what we want, for example, in an area like behavioral health, right, where we, where we can agree that um, access is really limited and a policy goal should be to increase uh, access to uh, behavioral health specialists. Um, so um, I, I think that we, we, the, the cost question is really key, um, and um, we should be looking at this. It's difficult to study it in the context of COVID. Uh, as Dr. Kuhn has pointed out, there's still a lot of in-person care avoidance going on, so it's difficult to say um, with the addition of telehealth whether costs have really gone up or not because healthcare-seeking behavior is, is not, um, is not you know, where it would typically be outside of a pandemic. I think also one of one of the arguments telehealth proponents have also made is that your costs are or your savings are actually captured downstream. Sort of, it's a preventive measure in that, as you've all pointed out, you have people getting services that they hadn't before, um, and maybe that is preventing a more expensive type of treatment further down the line. So that it's a little bit hard to capture those cost savings if they're there as well too. But so speaking of seeking out those services, um, one of the question I think a lot of people have. We spent a lot of time talking about mental health and services being provided during the pandemic for that, but Dr. Kuna, as a primary care provider, what other sort of um, conditions were you seeing uh, being treated with telehealth during the pandemic beyond sort of the, the mental health sphere? Um, I think certainly as primary care clinicians, we see a lot of patients with behavioral health issues, so certainly we did a lot of you know, anxiety and depression as sort of the front line um, workers for that on that front, but I do a lot of work in hypertension and diabetes, and I think hypertension, in particular, a lot of these chronic diseases, um, if a patient has access to like a home monitoring tool, so that you know that's sort of a, a separate payment issue. But um, for hypertension, if somebody has access to a home blood pressure monitor um, and they've been taught how to measure it, like that is something we absolutely can monitor with the patient very closely from from at home. Um, and di diabetes as well, you know, if they're using a glucose monitor and using it appropriately. So I think a lot of chronic disease management that involves a lot of self-monitoring at home is something that we can do safely and, and um, more effectively, actually, it, through telehealth. In particular, I think, to Dr. Usher's point, is that a lot of these patients, they really, you know, diabetes we think of as like an every three-month visit, but a lot of these patients benefit from a more frequent than every three-month visit. And if telehealth allows us to see them, uh, more frequently, or for example, better leverage other members of the healthcare team, right? So like connecting with a dietitian or a pharmacist in, in between, um, those may be more visits or more costs from like a utilization standpoint, but that is like better quality care. That's actually what we should be providing and we just haven't been able to because of access limitations. So I think there's a lot of chronic diseases that we can manage through telehealth very, very safely with as long as folks have sort of their home, home monitoring devices. 
you know, as someone who has a parent who has hypertension, I can attest to that. It's like, it's a lot better with like home monitoring, a lot better control over that. Um, there's been a lot of questions around parity in telehealth, both in parity of coverage, sort of like covering the same services that you would have if they were delivered in person or via telehealth, but also parity in payment. So I wanted to hear our panelists' thoughts on whether, you know, we should continue to see that once we're out of the public health emergency and once we're out of these temporary waivers, should there still continue to be parity in coverage and or in parity of payment for these telehealth delivered services? And um, Dr. Usher Pines, we'll just start with you. Sure. So, um, you know, parity is a very complex topic um, and it, I, it really, the payment will really drive provider behavior, right? And one thing that you want is to make sure that you um, reimburse for telemedicine in a way that will encourage providers to offer it, but will not cannibalize in-person care, right? So you want to make sure that um, they, they still provide in-person care and that patients at the end of the day get to choose the modality that works for them um, and when it's clinically appropriate. So um, there are just a lot of factors to keep in mind um, with payment parity. Dr. Brindell? Well, at APA, we support payment parity for telehealth visits um, and in-person visits. Uh, and behind that is really uh, uh, our experience that network adequacy in general um, has not been where it needs to be for the provision of mental health services. And so right now we're in a place where we have um, network inadequacy even in urban areas that have a disproportionate number of psychiatrists for the population compared to uh, more rural and, um, areas with fewer psychiatrists. But that being said, uh, telehealth alone is not going to solve the problem regardless of, um, of payment models and parity in terms of making sure that every American has access to high quality evidence-based mental health care. And so we also need to invest in technology and we need to invest in models of care that can really ex extend um, the availability of psychiatrists and other mental health clinicians to more and more patients. One model that we've really looked at is the collaborative care model um, and working within primary care pediatrics practices uh, with uh, physician led teams uh, to be able to provide consultation and improve access to mental health services within the settings that individuals are, are receiving care. So whether that could be done on the mental health side through telehealth availability uh, combined with in-person treatment uh, or some in-person visits at the primary care uh, uh, site of treatment uh, is something that we'll have to look at. We know that uh, patients um, are not unanimous and their feelings about this either. So about a third that we've surveyed would like to continue telehealth only. About a third want to go back and see their, uh, the, uh, see their doctors and other mental health care team members. Um, and a third would like a flexible approach, which I imagine is where we'll end up as we begin to learn more about what we can do most effectively and cost effectively uh, through virtual visits as opposed to in-person visits. Dr. Rendell, you brought up what the patients want, but we have a question from the audience on how providers feel about telehealth. So do providers feel about, how do providers feel about delivering telehealth? Do they like using it? What will determine whether they continue to offer it? Um, Dr. Kuhn, we're gonna start with you because you're actually a provider on this panel. So I don't know if you have any specific thoughts on this question here. Sure, I'm happy to um, answer it. I think this is really similar to patients, right? Like every patient has their own preferences for if they want in-person care or telehealth care. And similarly, some providers really like it. There are some providers who choose to practice a telehealth only clinics. And there are some clinicians, friends I know who are like, telehealth is just really making me super burnt out and I don't want to do clinical medicine because of it. And so I think there is really a range. Um, and hopefully I think clinicians can find a practice where they are in the spectrum or wherever they live on that spectrum where they are comfortable with the type of care that they're they're providing. 
I think what the pandemic has shown is like they like the option if it's there, but like with patients, it's not going to be appropriate for every situation. It, it really depends on the clinician and the patient and what's being treated as well at that time. Um, we have another audience question is, how can you assess the quality of care provided through telehealth on its own and in comparison to in-person care? Um, Dr. Usher Pines, I don't know if you want to take this one first. Sure, ha happy to address this. So, you know, in the past when we've done studies on telemedicine and RCTs on, on telemedicine, we've typically um, assigned half the patients to an, an episode of care where care will be delivered via telehealth and um, and then the other group, it's all in person, right? And then we compare outcomes. This is a bit of an outdated way to design a study. Um, and the research question now really should be, what's the appropriate dose of telehealth in the context of hybrid care models? Because there's a lot of hybrid care going on. So it may be the case that in certain specialties, let's say ophthalmology, um, very little telehealth um, should be delivered. Um, you know, maybe in the course of a year, one visit will be appropriate for telehealth with a particular patient. On the other hand, in something like behavioral health, it may be that most or all visits can be safely and effectively delivered via telehealth um, with few in-person visits. So it's really that dose question. Um, and I hope that, you know, research going forward really looks at this about um, appropriate hybrid care for different populations and for different specialties. You know, we've talked so much about the flexibilities and like the growth of telehealth, but let me just provide you some numbers here that despite the massive use of telehealth during like the last couple of years, um, really, it was just really a small percentage of outpatient Medicare spending. So my question to you all is, and, and anyone can jump in and answer this first, is do you think that will continue to remain that small amount? Or do you think perhaps there'll be more patient interest that'll drive it, that their interest in telehealth, we kind of touched upon it in our discussion, but um, let's explore it a little bit further, that interest from the patient will continue to like drive telehealth forward once we're beyond the public health emergency. Well, let me jump in here because I think interest from patients and also from clinicians is, um, uh, uh, interest is one important metric in this. If people don't want to come to telehealth, it's never going to be successful. On the other hand, it might not be successful just because people find it convenient and find it helpful and prefer it. So this idea of patient-centered care that's clinically appropriate um, and uh, that has evidence behind it is really the space that we need to be in. Now, what we do know is that uh, comfort with technology in clinical settings is far greater than we anticipated that it would be. And the pandemic was really a learning laboratory that showed us that. How we invest in technology and leverage technology to think about ways of um, improving access through apps, through uh, uh, gathering data, uh, and through coming up with new hybrid models, um, I, I think is really gonna be the future of where we're going to go. Uh, for those who really didn't have access in particular to mental health care pre-pandemic uh, that only got worse during the pandemic, the availability of telehealth uh, has to be something that we bring into a system of care and something that actually increases access and in particular those who have historically had the least access and need access the most. So uh, it remains to be seen, uh, but I think that's only one part of it. Mm -hmm. Um, we have another question, and this will be our last question before I ask our panelists for their closing thoughts here. Um, it's for behavioral health, but really, you know, this might apply to like any service delivered via telehealth in that should there be a face-to-face -face meeting, <coughs> excuse me, should, should there be a face-to-face -face meeting before telehealth is provided? Well, I guess I'll jump in here again on the, on the mental health question. You know, I, um, one thing that we're finding is that not requiring an in-person in -person visit has um, increased the availability, right? So 65% of uh, the telehealth services that were uh, provided in uh, the BPC study uh, happened outside of an existing treatment relationship. So that's a significant number. What really has to drive this are clinical indicators. Uh, learning about which presentations uh, require uh, a higher level of care to make sure that those who are the sickest uh, or the most at risk 
are really receiving what they need and not excluded from the level of services that others in, uh, for whatever reason, um, do have access to. So this is really a matter of equity and a matter of, uh, of, of treatment effectiveness for each and every patient. Yeah, and if I can just add to that, I don't think there's a lot of evidence suggesting that that face-to-face -face visit is essential for high-quality care via telehealth. So it may be just playing the role of um, being a guardrail to limit overall utilization of telehealth, and that is a goal, right? Policymakers may want guardrails to keep telehealth relatively contained because of cost concerns. So it really depends if, if you're thinking about quality or you're thinking about utilization with, with that particular requirement. And, you know, one unfortunate piece there is that by requiring that face-to-face -face visit, you are limiting the innovation that can occur in, you know, telemedicine-only organizations um, um, or care that's delivered to very remote patients, you know, in frontier areas or, or rural areas. So um, the consequence of that is um, keeping the benefits for, of telehealth from certain populations and providers. All right. Um, we are nearing the end of our time here. So I'm going to ask all of our panelists just for their closing thoughts here. And Dr. Kuhn, why don't we start with you? Um, well, this has been a really great conversation to hear from all the other panelists. I think. Um, I think just to echo some of the similar comments I made earlier, one is that uh, there's a lot of stuff we still don't know and we need to continue to study and really get into the details of um, what type of telehealth was delivered and who it was delivered for. And I think keeping in mind, ultimately, um, themes I heard, which is like, this is really focused on on sort of the patient and like thinking about the quintuple aim of healthcare, right? Like, are we achieving sort of better clinical outcomes, um, better population health? and sort of equitable outcomes, right? And so when we think about specific policy questions, I think we can get caught up in the details of, you know, is video versus audio, are they equivalent, are they equivalent to in-person care and really centering like what's the ultimate goal of healthcare, which is to improve population health and improve equity. And so really keeping that in mind when we think about um, policy decisions moving forward, I think will help ensure that we make sure equitable policies um, are available and that um, policies improve, improve access. Dr. Pine. Sure. So um, I guess I'll just wrap up with um, some calls for future research, right? You know, um, as we've said, there's a lot we don't know. I think there are key research questions on uh, costs, quality, and access. On the cost front, it's, you know, does telemedicine increase utilization? And if yes, is it for high value services, right? If it's increasing utilization, is it increasing population health? Like, so that's a, that's a key question. I already mentioned the question about what's the appropriate dose of telehealth in the context of hybrid care models. That, that's, that's really key. And then a third piece is um, access and equity. Are all populations using telehealth? Um, and if not, what are some of the promising strategies to bring telehealth uh, to the communities that, um, that aren't using it? So uh, specific strategies to bridge the di digital divide, for example. Dr. Brendel. Thank you. And um, thank you for the opportunity to be part of this uh, really exciting conversation. I feel like we're just getting started and we're at the end of our time for today. Uh, but let me just highlight uh, one other point. Um, I agree with my colleagues that ongoing research is really important um, for all the reasons that they've mentioned. Uh, we also, however, need to not be limited uh, by the need for more data in the progress and the gains that we've already made in delivering uh, mental health care uh, more broadly than we had been able to do prior to telehealth. You know, because we've made so many investments already um, in technologies and uh, created expectations of ongoing care, I want to make sure that as we um, as we do research, we're not interrupting the continuity of clinical care that has been established, that has allowed many Americans to access high quality mental health care while also uh, remaining, uh, keeping uh, a fair amount of humility about what the end of the story and the final chapter is going to be. Thanks so much for having me here today. And thank you also. Thank you, Dr. Lori Escher Pines, Dr. Elaine Kung, and Dr. Rebecca Brendel for this great discussion. Thank you also for the Bipartisan Policy Center for their ongoing work. Thank you to the Peterson Center on Healthcare for funding this project. Thank you also to everyone who attended today's talk. I look forward to continuing this conversation as policymakers consider all the important issues we have discussed today. Everyone have a great day. We'll see you soon. <laughs>